with the recent release of Battle Traits and an FAQ adding a whole new Dark Oath faction, I thought it was about time to go back and have another look at the Dark Oath Savages. Welcome to Wargames on Toast, all of you lovely people, it's me, it's Toast, and today we are checking out the Dark Oath Savages and all the weird and wonderful things they uniquely bring to the game. Out of all the bespoke warbands in Warcry, the Dark Oath Savages are one of the most interesting thanks to a diverse selection of abilities that do things that nothing else in the game does. Where most first edition warbands kind of feel a little bit samey, the Dark Oath look samey but actually play rather uniquely. So in celebration of the release of brand new Dark Oath that sadly left the Dark Oath Savages out, we're going to look at the Savages themselves and have a good time. But before we get into all of that, it's time for a little bit of shilling. I am shocked! Shocked! Well, not that shocked. Please consider leaving a like, a comment and subscribing as that helps me fight against the dastardly YouTube algorithmic demon. And if you want to help in a more tangible way, then please consider signing up to my YouTube members or my Patreon like all of these wonderful people on screen now. Badoosh. And if you don't want to dedicate yourself to a monthly subscription but still want to help the channel out, then feel free to throw me a coffee. But with all of that out of the way, let's get on with the show. And now for something completely different. And we are back and we are going to start with their newest addition to their lineup which is actually their battle trait which came in the Briar and the Bone. It is called Seeking Glory and it reads, after an enemy leader has been taken down by a melee attack action made by a friendly fighter with this battle trait, add two wild dice to your saved wild dice. So unfortunately this battle trait isn't actually that good because it only triggers when you kill an enemy leader and you only have one of those to kill per game. So this is functionally a once per game battle trait and the effect is okay gaining two wild dice and everybody can trigger it so a basic chaff getting the last hit would still gain the seeking glory wild dice buff but it's just not that impactful and it's just nowhere near good enough to sacrifice Alahai's thralls, monsters or, or bladeborn. It's just a little bit naff and that's a real shame. It's thematic because Dark Oath love killing things and love gaining wild dice and using those wild dice to gain new stats, but there's better ways in Dark Oath to generate wild dice, which we will see in a little bit. Moving on to their reaction, we have Instinctive Dodge. A fighter can make this reaction after they are targeted by an attack action. After the hit rolls have been made, roll a dice for every critical hit on a roll of a four plus that critical hit becomes a hit instead. This reaction is absolutely pants. What? No. There are versions of this reaction in the game now that are just better, that just remove crits from, uh, from the pool. This just doesn't do it. It's just on a four plus. It is so unreliable, you might as well just use counter and hope for the damage going through. I guess in a situation where you have to survive to like win the game or hold a point or whatever, popping an instinctive dodge to try and maybe survive is an okay idea, maybe, but it's just so unreliable and costing a whole action to maybe do nothing on a 50-50 as well, it's not really in your favour. Um, I am not a fan of instinctive dodge, it's honestly the biggest miss in Dark Oath Savages is that they just have an absolutely pants reaction, it's just not good at all. Moving on to their generic abilities, these are abilities that everyone within the faction can use. We start with their double, a vow fulfilled, and this is the defining feature or one of the defining features of Dark Oath Savages and that is permanence. It reads, until the end of this fighter's activation, each time an enemy fighter is taken down, you can pick either this fighter's toughness characteristic or the attacks or strength characteristic of one weapon this fighter is armed with. Until the end of the battle, add one to the characteristic you picked. This is a gamble. <laughs> it's a huge gamble. You have to use this before you get the kill so you can pop this and then get nothing because you flubbed your dice. As a general rule you'll only get this popped off once maybe twice per game and it'll likely be on one or two models in your warbands. 
mainly your leader because he is the most killy and if you can pump up his attack numbers or his toughness or even his strength in some cases he becomes an absolute murder machine he's already a murder machine so yeah it has uses but you have to go in knowing that you aren't really going to pop this off often and you aren't going to make all your guys suddenly superhuman you're going to use this once or twice on like one guy per game and maybe get plus one strength maybe get plus one attacks on your biggest burliest fighters our final universal generic dark oath kind of ability is our quad and it is called death blow and it reads add the value of this ability to the damage points allocated to enemy fighters by each hit and critical hit from the next melee attack action made by this fighter in this activation death blow is interesting because it makes every single person in your warband potentially incredibly dangerous adding up to six damage to your attacks and your crit means that even your chaff are now swinging potentially for minimum damage seven which is hilariously high they're then critting for like nine right that's a ludicrous profile to have even if they're low strength this is even crazier on your slaughter bone who go to minimum damage nine potentially ten if you add a plus one damage blessing on top of all of that the downsides of this is that you don't get a bonus attack action you don't get a bonus move action you just buff the actions you currently have and it's only the next one so if you flub that roll then you can get nothing out of this but that's the risk you take for potentially doing 50 damage in a single swing and honestly death blow is so much fun that i use it whenever i get a quad and i usually use it on my blessed slaughterborn who's also fulfilled one or two vows so he's an absolute murder machine doing up to 60 damage whenever he attacks it is hilarious he has one shot a chimera before it is just the funniest thing but it does have its downside and sometimes admittedly rampage might be the better option it is what it is so moving on to their heroes we have two options and they are both slaughter bones uh, one with great blade but badoosh and one with great axe also badoosh um these guys are both pretty darn good but i personally vastly prefer the slaughter bone with great axe because that 4635 is a beautiful profile it is really high strength really good damage and you still get four attacks and the slaughter bottom himself is quite squishy toughness for 20 wounds will only take you so far but this guy is going to get your kills he is going to buff his attacks like crazy once you start fulfilling your vows if you give him plus one uh damage he goes to a four six four five which is a super tight profile which will just start blending everything from elite things to chaff to mid-range it doesn't matter what it is they will start just getting cut down and the more he cuts down the stronger he gets it's a wonderful model that you can absolutely justify taking two of because they're just so solid just be aware they are susceptible to death dying and the grave because of only having 20 wounds the biggest hitters in warcry can feasibly one-shot them without much hassle so bear that in mind and use them accordingly but of course we can't move on till we talk about their ability which is called display of brutality which is in direct conflict with a vow fulfilled a fighter can only use this ability if an enemy fighter has been taken down by an attack action made by them this activation this fighter then makes a bonus move or a bonus attack action this is a super generic ability it is on so many things it's nothing special but it is situationally very good especially on a character who is so adept at killing things the slaughter born could possibly kill three models per turn the issue is if you want to get your vows going you can't use display of brutality at all so you have this really difficult situation where you can either vow before you attack to try and get a buff or don't vow and then wait until you get a kill and then use display of brutality or don't do any of that and use onslaught to secure the kill in the first place it's a really difficult three-way and usually the best option is just to pop onslaught if i'm being perfectly honest gaining that bonus attack is usually the right play but you do have two other very solid gamble abilities that are definitely worth considering especially if you aim to get a kill on turn two to get your vow for Build. moving on to the proven there are four proven um and they are all okay um they've all got the same defensive stats of moving four toughness four and 15 wounds but their attack stats vary wildly and as do their points they range from 115 all the way to 130 i'll put them all on screen now every time boosh 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 uh so we have the great axe 
Uh, this last is one of my favorite because she is just a mini slaughter born. 3535 is just a nice profile. She'll start cutting through things. If she is going to kill something, don't be afraid to pop a Valve Fulfilled to give her an extra attack, extra strength maybe, to make her even kill you before she eventually goes down. Although having 15 wounds does make that a little bit more difficult. Um, the Great Spear is also pretty good. Having a range 2, 3 attacks, also strength 5 with 2, 5 damage is absolutely respectable. Um, that lower damage end is a bit of an issue. You're less likely to get kills, but that range 2 and maintaining strength 5 and still having those 15 wounds and being cheaper by 5 whole points means you can keep her safe. She's much more defensive. She can reach out and poke things without having to put herself in danger and really make use of those defensive stats. Moving on to Conan the Barbarian, or the Proven with Great Blade. I am torn with this guy. His attack stats are fine at a 4424. That's a high volume of attacks. That's a decent strength. And the damage is also fine, especially when he's 10 points cheaper or 15 points cheaper than the other two options we've talked about. The issue is, I think I would rather just fork out the extra points and just take the uh, the Great Axe, honestly. Because gaining an extra attack, but losing a strength, losing a damage, and losing a crit, it's a lot to ask, even if you are 15 points cheaper, right? But on the other end of the spectrum, I am actually a pretty big fan of the Proven with Great Flail. Uh, three inch range is always nice. Three, four, two, four is an absolutely fine profile. And again, retaining those solid defensive stats of toughness four and 15 wounds and still only being 115 points. Um, this lad is probably my favorite alongside the Great Axe. And if I was to build Proven, I'll be building Great Flails and Great Axes as much as I possibly could because they're both really good. One kills things with big old strength and one stays behind and supports by swing things with his big old flail. Again, range three, a solid defensive line. This guy's hard to deal with and he's just effective at controlling space. And because he has that incredible range, he's also surprisingly good at proccing his vow because he can stay behind things and then chip off the last wounds of things that are injured by that great axe, allowing you to increase his strength or his attacks to make him more independently brutal. Next up is one of my favorite models in Dark Oath and it is the God Speaker. For 105 points, which is very cheap, you gain movement 4, toughness 3, and 12 wounds. You have two attack profiles, one in melee, which is a 3-3-1-3, which is a dagger, basically. And the other is your standard wizard profile of 2-3-3-6. And I love this model. She is cheap enough to bring one of, to possibly bring two of. That range profile is always nice. And she's one of the better options for a Valve Fulfilled, because a Valve Fulfilled does not specify you have to kill with a melee attack action nor does it specify it has to buff a melee attack at all, which means if the God Speaker gets a kill or two, she could increase her strength by two or her attacks by two or both by one, and then suddenly your damage output becomes a lot higher. Being a 4-3-3-6 is a recipe for utter chaos, and that's not even the best part because she has the Mystic Rune Mark, which gives her a really fun ability. You may have noticed that so far the Dark Oath really like to gamble their dice with a Vow Fulfilled and Display of Brutality. Well, Visions of Glory allows you to gamble even more dice, but the trade-off is getting even more dice. So Visions of Glory reads, roll a number of dice equal to the value of this ability. For each five plus, add one wild dice to your saved wild dice. Visions of Glory is fantastic. I love this. If I have a high double, I will almost always use this on Visions of Glory. If you're rolling six dice, you are on average getting two dice back. And providing you don't use wild dice to use this ability, you can really amass a huge stockpile of wild dice, especially if you do Visions of Glory, wait, activate Visions of Glory to use this twice. There are very few things on turn one that are more satisfying than having a double six and a double five and then generating four bonus wild dice for turn two and then controlling the game until the end of time because you have so many wild dice you can pick who has initiative every single turn for the rest of the game. Not to mention you are also free to make any singles and doubles and any doubles and triples and any triples and the quads without any knockback because your resources are through the roof. You will nearly always roll Visions of Glory on a double six or a double five and frankly a double three and double four are absolutely viable too. This ability combined with the fantastic wizard profile and the low cost to entry make the God Speaker one of the best units Dark Oath has access to. And honestly, I'm not against taking two and that's because the next guy is the same price and I don't really have a use for this chap. 
He is called the Wrath Touched, and he's 105 points with movement 4, toughness 4, and 15 wounds, and a 4415 profile. Now, as the casual meme player I am, I actually enjoy the Wrath Touched with plus 1 crit, because then he just goes in and tries to crit fish with his 4416 profile, and that's kind of hilarious. But competitively, the Wrath Touch does leave a lot to be desired. Shua 4 attacks is nice, Shua 4 strength is nice, and Shua having 15 wounds is also nice. But 1-5 damage is so unreliable, I would rather just spend the 10 points and take a Proven with Great Blade, right? Who has plus 1 damage. It's, it's, a, it's a bargain to take the Great Blade over the Wrath Touch. There's very little reasons in terms of raw stats why you'd ever take the Wrath Touched when the Great Blade is right there, which is a shame. And then you have the fact that his ability is also not that great. It's a triple, our first triple and our orderly triple, and it's called Furious Rampage. Roll a dice for each visible enemy fighter within three inches of this fighter. On a roll of a three or four, allocate one damage to the fighter being rolled for. On a roll of a five plus, allocate a number of damage points to the fighter being rolled for equal to the value of this ability is so unreliable. Shua doing one damage to everything within three inches on the three plus is kind of fine. As a double, maybe. Um, but as a triple, it's not fantastic. And Shua on a five plus, which is more reliable than the usual six plus, you're doing dice damage. It's kind of okay. There are just better things you can spend your dice on. There are situations, especially against larger warbands, where you can use this to burn a bunch of chaff. But as we'll see in the list building section and ally section, there are better ways of utilizing uh, allies to do a very similar effect to this. And I am just not a fan of the Wrath Touched. Even more so now that other factions have gained this kind of ability that is guaranteed and reliable on doubles. This feels really dated now, and the Wrath Touch poor stats just don't really do anything for it either. I almost forgot the Curse of Withering. So the Godspeaker has a second ability and a rare case of a faction having two quads. So the Curse of Withering reads, pick a visible enemy fighter within three inches of this fighter and roll a number of dice equal to the value of this ability. For each roll of a four to a five until the end of the battle round, subtract one from that fighter's toughness characteristic to a minimum of one. For each roll of a six until the end of the battle, subtract one from that fighter's toughness characteristic. Now the Curse of Withering is interesting because it allows you to basically nuke something. So things you can't easily punch through like Annihilators, Vexmores, Annihilators, <laughs> right? Things that have got really high toughness. You can use Curse of, Curse of Withering to pull that toughness right down. And with the potential to permanently reduce toughness on those six rolls, it has uses. Reducing an Annihilator down to toughness four makes it so much easier to kill with literally everybody, but Deathblow is right there. And if you use Deathblow on the right targets, their toughness really won't matter because your damage is so darn high. It's fun. It fits that theme of permanence that was started with a vow fulfilled because it does a permanent effect potentially. But it just isn't all that great and I would likely never use it. Um, I haven't found a situation yet whilst playing Dark Oath where I would pick Curse of Withering over a Rampage or over a Deathblow. And I usually take two Godspeakers. <laughs> so if anyone was going to use Curse of Withering a lot, it would be me, but I don't. And it's because it's just not that good. If it was a triple, maybe I would use it. But as a quad, mm-mm. That's a, that's a hard miss for me. Our final units are the Glory Seekers, and we have five Glory Seekers. They all have roughly the same stats with movement four, toughness three, or toughness four if they have a shield, and 10 wounds. And they also vary in points from 65 all the way to 75 points. Boosh, 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 boosh. And they're okay. They're all pretty okay. We'll start with, we'll start with the most expensive, who is the Glory Seeker with Spear. I quite like the Glory Seeker with Spear. Range 2, 10 wounds. You know, it's it's one of the more durable ones by virtue of your opponent likely has to move into combat with you, which functionally halves their damage output. And being a 3 4, 1 4 is just your standard Spear profile, but being strength 4 means you've got a bit of an advantage when fighting other chaff, maybe. So 
is quite nice. Going down to the 70 point laddies, we have the Seeker with Shield and the Seeker with Paired Weapons. And again, both are kind of nice. Uh, 3, 4, 1, 3 on the Shield with Toughness 4 is pretty darn good. Again, being Strength 4 is not insignificant. Most chaff are Strength 3. You being Strength 4 gives you that advantage, especially if you yourself are Toughness 4 against other chaff. They're hitting you on 5s and you're hitting them on 3s. The issue is you are only 1-3 damage, which is, again, standard for chaff, but 1-3 damage ain't going to do all that much. So there is that. This guy's, again, one of the more defensively orientated guys. But for 70 points, I am a little bit of a fan. I am less of a fan of the Glory Seeker with paired weapons. Again, 70 points. This guy has plus 1 attack compared to the shield guy, but has minus 1 toughness. He retains strength form. Uh, this guy, again, is more of a blender and is much more capable of killing chaff, but is also more susceptible to dying to chaff because he's only toughness 3, so he's really relying on those 10 wounds to stay alive, and that will only go so far. The most interesting pick, though, is this 65-point lad who only gets 2 attacks at a strength 4, but he is 2-4 damage, and he's only 65 points. And I like this guy an awful lot because he is so gosh darn cheap. 65 points for 10 wounds is always pretty darn good. And sure, toughness 3, you can take it or leave it. But again, strength 4 is really solid at 65 points, and being 2-4 damage means that every one of your low number of attacks does a decent chunk of damage. Nobody likes to take two damage from a swing, especially from other people's chaff. So the big winners for me in the Glory Seeker category are definitely those shield boys and definitely that guy with the big old axe. The issue with Glory Seekers, and to a, to a, to a lesser degree, the Proven, is that the Dark Oath Savager box is a little bit awkward to work with because it's a first edition box and you get a variety of weapons but not enough to be able to make exactly what you would want in a list. So before I go on to list building and allies and all that kind of thing, the box itself comes with one Slaughterborn who has either the blade or the axe, you have one Godspeaker, one Wrath Touched and then you get your two Proven but one proven can only be built with a spear or an axe and the other can only be built with a blade or a flail so you can't effectively spam out axes or flails which is a bit of a pain and then the glory seekers are just complicated you get two glory seekers who can use shields or paired weapons you've got one seeker who can have a spear or paired weapons you've got one guy who can take an axe or paired weapons and you've got one guy you can have a shield or a spear. So all of that is really awkward because you get five glory seekers, but only two can have shields, only one can have the axe, and the axe and the shields are my favorite. So if I was to make a pure Dark Oath Savages list, I would need to buy two or three boxes or convert them, which makes them really awkward to start. And it's just not fun to deal with that many really annoying weapon loadouts. So moving on to allies, there are a few I'm a big fan of and unsurprisingly several of these come from Dark Oath itself. Just be aware that all of the buffing abilities that standard Dark Oath can do, do not affect the Dark Oath Savages. This makes models like the Dark Oath War Queen or the Dark Oath Chieftain far less valuable. But it also means that allies who don't buff anything are just good in combat are actually really really good and the two i'm a huge fan of are war queen tanari and to a lesser extent guna brand B uh, badush badush so war queen tanari is rather special because she has a rather wonderful triple called war queen's fury i did a whole video on brands earthbound over here badush check that out after this video and this triple is really cool in short it allows tanari to attack everything in an aoe which is really, really fun. And in a similar way, Gunnar Brand can drastically increase the number of attacks he gets, allowing him to blend through things effortlessly. And because they are standard Dark Oath, they also gain access to the rather wonderful Oath of Murder, which should absolutely pop on turn one. And of course, both of these models are super thematic within Dark Oath. The final Dark Oathian ally I would suggest would actually be the Dark Oath Fell Rider Champion, with either Javelin or Axe. This guy is only 140 points, he is movement 10, and he has 20 wounds. This model adds speed to a warband that is otherwise very, very slow, and he does it at a very reasonable price. 140 points is very reasonable for the stats you're getting here, 
I am a big fan of the Fell Rider Champion with Axe within Dark Horse, and I am sure you will find some uses too. Other powerful picks for Dark Horse Savages is naturally things like Vexmoor. This guy fills in that durability issue, being toughness 6, 25 wounds. This guy hits for 10, strength 10, 5, 10 damage at range 2. He's got built-in mobility tricks. As boring as Vexmore is, Vexmore is everywhere in Chaos because he is the universal band-aid. He is cheap, he just does work, he threatens space, and he can just spike like crazy. He's an obvious pick within Chaos, and I would not blame anyone for using him because I use him too. It is just what it is. Going off the back of Vexmo, you have your more standard allies, things like Varangard, who are very killy, very durable, and very fast. Or if you want some more utility, a thing that Dark Horse lack in faction, then taking the True Blood from Splintered Fang gives you the best net in the game, again, for a fairly reasonable price, and she comes with a pretty good stat line to boot. So that's a lot of information I've just thrown at you all in one go. So I'm going to throw up an example list, but douche, for you to use as a jumping off point when you start your Dark Oath Savager's journey. And that's Dark Oath Savages. I am a huge fan of Dark Oath Savages on a more casual level, but also I do think there is some competitive play because they do have access to fairly cheap chaff who are also semi-durable. You've also got access to that rather wonderful Slaughterborn. Some of their proven are pretty good. And of course you are Chaos, so you have access to some rather fantastic abilities to boot. And because your trait is pretty darn pants, you are free to ally and you won't be missing out anywhere. My biggest takeaway when it comes to Dark or Savages is that they are fairly easy to play. Their abilities are unique and simple, their stat lines are fairly solid across the board, they can bring fairly large warbands which makes them fairly forgiving to play, and they're just a lot of fun to mess around with. You have ample wild dice, you've got ample damage, throwing out those death blows from time to time just opens up all kinds of hilarious stories where your one 180 point slaughterborn murderizes the largest biggest demon ever known to man. But that's the end of this video, if you liked what you saw please consider subscribing and leaving a like. And let me know in the comments down below what you think of the Dark Oath Savages. Have I missed something? Did I get something wrong? Do you disagree with my hatred of the Wrath Touched? Let me know and we'll have a good old natter about it. But until next time, lads, ladies, and everybody in between and beyond, ta-ra. Groovy. Boy howdy, it's me, it's Toast, and we are here once again with the Post Toast credits. As always, a huge shout out to my algorithmic demon slayers, Armour Enthusiast 7, Andy Morris, Girth Demon, The Head Knight of Paint, Heinz D, Long Run Hobbies, Lord Phylax, Sable Saber, Brioche, Steve Bean, The Houston Toad, Tough Tootin' Baby, and Velas. A huge thank you for all of your support, and I will see you all next time.